Awesome. So I am Rick Cusick. I am the Chief Information Officer at Reading Plus. We're a small ed tech company across the river in Winooski. Um, as the name suggests, we build a product that helps kids learn how to read better. Um, I've had the chance to work with a lot of you in this room over the past couple of years. It's, it's, it's awesome to see you. It's awesome to be here. And, and thanks for Jillian for putting this on. Um, it's fantastic to have all this energy in one room. Yeah. Um, so what I'm going to talk today about is uh, this. The talk is called Stories for Humans. And uh, this is my intro slide. Um, it's telling me that uh, the edges of my presentation might get a little clipped because those circles should be whole. So let's see how this goes, shall we? <laughs> Can you adjust that? Yeah, that's, so yeah, just a speaker thing. Like, do your first slide with all your circle, draw shapes at the edge of your slide. Thank you. Yes. <laughs> and have awesome people running your conference. <laughs> Sweet. And, and by the way, I, I, I can't, if, if you haven't seen Pete Brown do stand up, you're missing out. <laughs> I'm serious. Like, I, I should go see it. Um, so, stories for humans. So this, are, so this is me, at Rick Cusick on Twitter. I don't use Twitter a lot, but I, I do occasionally check it just to keep up with things. I'm more of a Twitter consumer than a content creator. Um, the art in the presentation is from an artist over in the Hudson Valley. His name is John Muth. If any of you have kids and know the book Zen Shorts, you'll know these art, this art. It's uh, these beautiful watercolors. Um, I'm partial to pandas. I don't know why. <laughs> Something happened at a zoo when I was a kid, I guess. Um, stories for humans. So what is this all about? Um, for me, when I come to a conference, and this is where this gets, this, I'm going to start meta, I'm going to end meta, and I'm going to talk practical in the middle. My first meta thing is that when I go to a conference, I generally take a couple things away from each talk. Sometimes I listen and I see something that I've been working on too, and I realize that that pattern that, that's being displayed is something that I may be working on and that feels really validating and I'm like, yay, social validation, it's awesome. Then sometimes I see something that I've never heard before, and I think to myself, how can I bring that back to my shop and use it? How can I bring that back to my shop and extend it and make it better? And then the third kind of thing I take away from a conference is something that is not necessarily practical, but it's totally inspiring. So I'm hoping today that you find one of those three things in this talk. Something either familiar, something new that you can use, or something inspiring. So the three practical things I'm hoping you take away from this the big one is shared understanding and the value of shared understanding. Um, I, was, I was thrilled in Ethan's talk that you said shared understanding because I was like, great, that's, so that's a pattern, so social validation. Uh, so I think this is the most important thing when you're designing products in a, in a space where you have a lot of people working on the same product. And I'll explain what that means in a couple slides. Um, the, the second piece, there are awesome tools and there are awesome processes and there are great ways to do things and they're out there, these patterns. People are always talking about them. Some are going to work for you, and some of them are not going to work for you. And if that sounds like a hedge, it's not. It's just reality. You all have your own cultures where you work. Okay? So those tools in your culture, pick the ones that are going to add and complement your culture and contribute to your culture. Okay? The last thing is uh, humans. I know this is a user experience conference. And um, right now, we're at Reading Plus, we're on a big customer experience kick. Uh, I, I, this is for me, maybe personally, what I'm trying to take away from this talk is not to forget that they're human beings and we have one small part to play in their lives. So, humans. Um, I'm going to start with uh, the dropping my water bottle. Uh, the shared understanding piece is where I'm going to start today. Um, the diagram on the board comes from a book by a friend of mine named Jeff Patton. Uh, Jeff, I met Jeff a few years ago at the Balanced Team Conference in Chicago. It's where I met uh, Gail, who's speaking later today. Um, it, it was really a, a transformative day in my life when I met that group of people at that conference. And I highly recommend that if you search for Balanced Team and you can go to the conference or the summit, you do it. Um, so I met Jeff there, um, and he was talking a lot about shared understanding, which at that point I didn't have a firm grasp of. And now I've come to preach the gospel of this. Um, when I say the holy grail of designing products at scale, what I'm saying is that for us in ed tech, it's more than just product designer, engineer, and maybe even a product owner. We have all these other people that are involved, psychometricians and research people and instructional people, and they all need to understand things the same way. And so the, I love the graphic because it's got these three people that are talking about something and they're like, we agree, because they're all thinking a different thing in their head. 
And it's only by getting it out in front of the, each other in a drawing or some other kind of commitment in a visual way that they actually see what they're talking about. So this is that first part of shared understanding. Because we're in business, we need to do this quickly. You know, we could come to shared understanding and we could take forever to do it, and then we'll never make anything. So what I want to pitch today is the idea of this talk is the two most valuable things that we have found when you're trying to get to shared understanding quickly, your culture and the tools that you choose. So I'm going to talk a little bit about both those two things today. OK, culture. So I'm going to start with culture. Um, culture happens, whether we do it or not. Whether we shape it or not, it's going to happen. It's in our organizations. It's kind of like the force. Like it surrounds us and binds us together. And you either make it or it happens. Um, and then, uh, again, I was thrilled in Ethan's presentation about the stuff about words, because words are everything. And I love, like from a foundational standpoint, I work for a reading company. And language is everything. And so when we talk about culture, the language that we use in our company is super important because it, it means that we agree on this term means this. And how far reaching something simple as that is becomes clear when you start to have disagreements or opinions about what's most valuable. So. Um, there's a really strong thing, a beautiful thing about culture that I love is that you can't see it when you're in it. But when you're new, it's like glaringly obvious. And I think there's no point that this becomes more apparent if you're in a shop is your first three months, 100 days, right? So we have a, one of my new people is in the audience. I think Jacqueline is in the audience, yeah. So Jacqueline joined us about 50 days ago. So she's halfway through her culture-free period. And there's been a few times where we'll walk out of a meeting and she'll come up to me and she'll be like, come here, come here. did that just mean what I think it means? You know? Because to her, the culture is completely on, on fire. And it's all new to her. To us, it's like, yeah, this is exactly how we do things. You know, that first slide, like we agree. Of course we agree. We use the same word. So the new people are the key to your culture. They detect your language for what it is. They don't fall into the jargon that you've used. And so speaking of jargon, I want to just make sure this is something that, again, maybe this is more for me than you. Use the language of the humans you serve. So for us, we serve educators and students. So we need to use their language. Like one of our big learnings, um, we named our, pro our program has fluency, comprehension, and vocabulary. And we named the programs these really cool names, so we thought, <laughs> for branding purposes, right? You want to make it yours. So we named it something. And now we're kind of coming full circle where it's like, let's just call it reading, <laughs> vocabulary. And you know, it's, it's, it's funny, though, because at that moment, you're like, you know, you've all been in the room, right? You're in that room, and you're like, that's a cool name. Yeah, and you're all nodding your heads. Maybe if there's a new person in the room or one of your customers, they're like, it's freaking reading. Like, <laughs> why do you need to brand it? So, right, it's tough. It's tough. You've all been in that meeting, right? <laughs> so, all right. Well, to wrap up culture, I want to put ours on the board. Um, these are uh, a couple of years now. Always refining them. The best part about this was that the leadership team got together and did a whole bunch of work on what our values were. And they went through some churn and some change. And then eventually, what rose up to the top were the values that everybody agreed on, were the values that were, that were bubbled up from the customer service team. The people who are closest to the customer, the people who talk to the customer, who share their language, who share their culture, their impact on our cultural values was the really big, aha, like this is what matters. This is us extending our culture into, our, into, our, into the humans that we serve. So here's our problem. So this is my problem. This is your problem. This is our problem, because we live in this country. Uh, more than half the kids, this is about five years ago, more than half the kids in the country, 2009, 2010, that graduated high school couldn't read at a great appropriate level. Even more, this is, I, I got this yes, stat on the, on the, yesterday on the way out. Uh, Jeff gave me this stat. 40% of the people in this country who graduate college never read another book again their entire lives. So what does that say about us? We love Wikipedia articles, or we don't love to read, 
or we don't know what we love to read, or that when we read, we're speaking inside our heads, so vocalizing, so that it's really tiring to read. But this is our problem space. So what are we gonna do about it? What, so what we started with is the MVE. I started calling it the MVE, again, language, because you've all, if you've seen Silicon Valley, the first episode is called Minimal Viable Product. Yeah, it's beautiful. Uh, I, I started calling it the MVE after the fact because I like to Monday morning quarterback. Um, because it wasn't just the product that was going to make the difference and the impact in these kids' lives. It was going to be the experience end to end of the work that we did training their teachers, of the work that we did post processing it with them, getting their feedback. And this experience extended beyond the tiny snippet of time that my microphone blipped, the tiny snippet of time that they were actually using the product. And we had these two big goals because we have these two giant cultures of people that we're trying to serve. And the first group is the students. Uh, students, right? So this was the goal. I, I, I actually look back in the original scope document from years ago, and this was the original goal, is to create a fun and engaging experience that inspires a love of reading. There's nothing in that statement about actually improving how they read, improving their comprehension, fluency, nothing about it. What matters is that they end up loving reading. Because the kid who won't read is no better off than the kid who can't. That's a quote from David Pearson, who's one of our advisors. He's like a, a, a legend in the reading community. And I remember hearing that and being like, wow, that's a big deal. And, and, and I'm a technical person. And that like touches you in the feels, right? And you're like, holy cow. Second, that students can't do it alone. Um, who has a good coach, right? If you ever have a good coach, think about it now. Think about your coaches. Your coach makes a difference. They point out where you're weakest and they help you work on it. So we have to give the educators some tools to help them make the difference in these kids' lives. So these are our two big goals. So how are we gonna do it? So this is the tools piece. So I've talked culture and we've bled into tools a little bit, okay? Um, I'm gonna put these up on the board because I wanna just see them all. Um, we didn't do any of these things when we started this. We had never built a story map. We had never heard of a persona. And we never really did prototypes. And by the end of this process, we had done all of these to a, a huge degree. Um, this was about us changing, right? And there's been a couple of those designers change. Um, we had to design a few of these things ourselves and learn from them. And again, uh, I got a lot of help from uh, people in the UX community that I was working with at that time. Um, so I owe a massive amount of debt to my mentors. Um, quick plug, if you are good at this stuff, you should be a mentor. You should be finding people to help. If you are learning this stuff, you should find a mentor, someone who will help you. Because if you just ask somebody, I just emailed Jeff Patton out of the blue and was like, hi, this is me, this is what I'm working on, please help me, and he emailed me back. And I had no idea that he would do that. And I think, you know, there was a, Emily was telling a great story yesterday about this conference, and this conference came to be as awesome as it is because somebody just asked. So you're on a ladder here, one hand up, one hand down, right? So that's my, my plug about that. Um, so we were gonna build a story map. If you uh, work in an agile way, uh, you don't do agile, agile's not a noun. If you work in an agile way, you're familiar with this idea, okay? So. A story map is a backlog that you build chronologically, like you're making a movie, okay? You, the humans who you serve are actors in a movie that you're creating. You are a bit part, you're a bit actor. You're like an NPC, right? You know what an NPC is? <sighs> Dating myself. Um, you're, you're <laughs> your backlog is supposed to be these things called user stories. As a user, I want to do X so I can Y. Well, Y. Uh, descriptive, right size, prioritized. You're building a movie, you're building the story of what they're gonna do. So uh, what we started with was, we started with the student experience. And, and we've never done this before, but Jeff had given us a bunch of tools for how to build this. Left to right, what are the things that they're gonna do? What are the tasks that they're gonna accomplish in this program? Left to right, they're gonna log in, I'm gonna read my messages, maybe I'll reply to messages to my teacher. I'm going to choose a few stories in like a little Netflix kind of thing, what's recommended, I'm going to pick it, I'm going to read it. And because we always have to be evaluated in this country, I have to answer some questions about whether I actually understood it. 
And then within that, those big pieces, I haven't written a user story yet. I just take them and I wrap them into these modules. And I say, well, I'll call this the stories module. I'll call this the questions module. This speaks to the architecture of the system. This is where engineering can begin to get their heads around how it actually is built. And then I start to build my stories. As a user, I want to log in so that I can access my dashboard, stuff like that. If you work in an agile way, you, you're, this should start to sound familiar to you. And then what we do is we keep building these things out until we have all these details and we're prioritizing top to bottom, left to right. And we would have these huge walls in our office with these giant story maps and you'd start and you'd walk down the story map and you'd read it as you went. And you'd come to a place and you'd be like, wait, uh, uh, that's out of order. And it was like piano lesson. You ever take piano lessons where you have to start over if you make a mistake? And you have to go back to the beginning, you'd start the story over and you'd do it again and again until you finally got to the place where you felt like the story was complete. And then we took that and we sliced it and we figured out that top line was what we needed to build to be able to get kids to read a decent story and be able to learn something from it and loop and get something instructionally valuable out of it. So that's our scenario and that's that first release. And then we had a snag. Because as a user, I could be anybody. And these are my humans, these kids. And they're not in the room with me. It brings up all kinds of privacy violations. And I'm, you know, I'm, I don't want to use my own kids as test subjects. Well, I do, but uh, <laughs> it leads to a certain amount of bias because they live in a bubble called Charlotte, which is in a bigger bubble called Vermont. Right? Right? So I need to abstract out. So this is persona generation. So uh, we created these pragmatic personas. Um, qualities of users that would influence choices you would make in designing your interface. Designing for the not ideal state. Again, I love that. I'm stealing from Ethan's presentation. Because I, I love that. Because the not ideal state is a kid who has no interest in reading. Beyond the network or beyond the, the, the abilities of the device, the abilities of the human who's actually trying to use this thing. If you're a struggling reader, how much can you get out of instructions on a page that tell you how to use the application? Right? But we've got to be thinking about that. And that's tough for a 40 or 50 something engineer sitting in an office in a bubble called Winooski in a bubble called Vermont. Right? So we generated these personas by getting input from our teachers and our educators about what these kids were actually like. Picture, quote, bunch of qualities about them, keep them in the room with us. And one of the beautiful things was one of the kids at the Boys and Girls Club over here um, said, literally said the quote that our persona said that we had made up on the fly and some kid said it to us and put his head down on the desk and we were like, that's awesome, that's terrible, you know, it's just great, like, who knows what's good or bad. But the teachers, we could go a little bit deeper because we had access to them and they wanted to talk about what they liked and what they didn't like. And so we did these really detailed interviews and these beautiful persona posters and we came up with who we thought was our user of highest value, it was Meredith, rock star teacher, totally invested in her kids, ready to dive deep. And we designed the interface based on her. And there was this great moment where two of the people in, the, in one of the design meetings were arguing over who was the user of highest value. And I remember feeling really frustrated about this. I was like, I can't believe we're arguing about this. And somebody under their breath was like, Psst, they didn't even know what a persona was like two years ago. Mm -hmm. Now they're arguing over which is the most important. And it was like, yeah, you're right. So that's progress. Um, so we chose Meredith as our user of highest value because she was the one who would jump from school to school and bring our product with us. That's great. And I think we got this one wrong. Like I'm saying this for the first time publicly today. I think we got this wrong. Um, there's another persona. She's not up here. She's Penny. She was untrained. She wanted a big red button in the middle of her interface that just said, fix this stuff. Just fix it. Because she didn't have time. She didn't have training. She wasn't really invested in her kids because she had way too much to do. She was more, more concerned with them showing up to class if they had enough to eat. Were they OK? Were their clothes clean? She was concerned with much more of basic level of services for her kids. She didn't want the ability to drill down to 75 data points. So there's something about not just your user who's the most valuable, but how frequently they occur across the ecosystem of the humans you serve. So, there I said it, we got it wrong. Um, biggest thing about personas, I think they're great design tools, they're also empathy builders. It's hard to dismiss your users, and, and if you've never dismissed your users by thinking about, ah, they don't care. I think you raise your hand because I, I salute you. <laughs> Sometimes just in the heat of things, you're like, well, this isn't really going to bum people out if we knock the server over for five minutes in the middle of the day so that we can do this quick binary log dump. 
<laughs> See? You know what I'm talking about. Um, so I love, this is one of my favorite pictures. It's the, the, the little girl bakes a cake for the, the panda. Um, so it's beautiful. Empathy. And empathy in action, compassion. So have some compassion for your users. That's that part about those personas being valuable that way. Uh, last piece quickly, because I think I'm going to pick it up a little bit. Um, I saw Jared Spool talk uh, a couple years ago. Um, I think it was in Chicago, actually. And he put this slide up, and it blew my mind, because I loved what he described. Draw two paths, left to right. If you're doing story maps, this is a natural fit. Draw the current path, which is that bottom solid line of your current experience, and then across the top, draw the aspirational experience. And that dif difference between them is where you innovate. And so where this showed up for us was we had to build this one component in our reading program that was really easy to do with Flash or Java applets. And we were going to do it. And then but the development team was like, you know what, actually, can we please not do that? And customer service was like, yes, please don't do that. Please no Java. Because their aspirational experience up to that, their, their experience up to that point had been this Java applet that did this for them. And from a user experience standpoint, you know, Java rocks. <laughs> As in like, it's a bag of rocks. <laughs> so, so we didn't want to do that. And um, when, we've, when we started this, we, we made a bet. You know, I mean, Ishmael's here. We placed a bet that by the time this thing had to go to production, the tools would be in the browsers for us to be able to do this, and that we would have the guts to tell schools, no, I'm sorry, you can't use IE8. Right? So this, yeah, this goes back to this. So this is something else. This goes back to somewhere between courage and hubris. I don't know which this is, but this is this. I, I, I say it's courage, because we got it right. But part of this was that the Canvas element got better and better in all the browsers. And then there's this thing, request animation frame. And St. Paul Irish, wherever you are, thank you very much for creating a bunch of shims that let us do this. And we ended up creating this really awesome experience that was this, uh, and it's, it was all HTML5. There's no plugins. And it's really subtle to see like the gradient at the front and the back edge and the fact that it opens really quickly at the beginning of the line because when you and I read, our I actually doesn't land on the first letter. It lands on like the third or fourth letter. It had to, it all this crazy math, right? And we wouldn't have been able to do this. We could have settled, and we didn't because we innovated saying we don't want plugins in our interface. We don't want Java applets, and we don't want Flash, God forbid. So, nothing against Flash. So this is what we had. So we used the story map to generate our backlog. We prioritized it, and that became how we did our release plan. Uh, we used personas to define what was v most valuable up front, which was helpful later on. Uh, we used prototyping to innovate and get our experience together. And the last thing we had to learn from our customers, we built these interfaces, and we, we placed the cards on the wall with the actual really nice mock-ups and the UI designs. And then we were ready, and, and I throw this in here now just because not everybody was on board with the first release. Some people were a little bit embarrassed by it. They didn't think it would work, and they didn't think it was good enough. And I love this slide because it's like, yeah, if you think you're ready, you waited too long. Right? So I agree with this. Of course I do because I was the one who was pushing minimal viable. Uh, so we, we did this first test with this class of kids. They were reluctant readers, and uh, they were not thrilled to use Reading Plus. They had been using it for a couple years already at that point. And they had this first class. I remember we were sitting around on a Skype call afterwards and the teacher had the kids in the class and she's like and, and so she says uh, they, they know it's a beta but they want to know if they can do it at home tonight and we were like sweet so we, we have something now we've got something they actually like to use it it's it's life savory enough that they're they're into it right so we created an enjoyable experience and that was half of what we had to do the second half was that first big hairy problem that we had in the, on the seventh slide which is that reading piece, and, and how did it actually work? So it worked even better than we could have imagined and has been working better than we could have thought. And this is part of that shared understanding piece, is that we could make a program that does the reading piece really, really well and has them answer questions. And it could have been very game-like, and that would have been awesome, and they may have even loved it more, but it might not have worked. And so what you see here is that the more lessons that the kids did, the more they made up. And, and the key is that if you remember that slide at the beginning, if kids are falling behind, we can't just catch them. The only way we can catch them up is by them making more than a year of gain in a year. So all the kids who are doing more than 40 lessons, about 15 hours, and that's about over 24 weeks. 
So it's less than an hour a week, these kids are making up a little bit of ground. And then in middle school, it's even bigger. High school not as big because high school kids, they're a little tougher. You were all in high school, come on. Um, this is the most shocking slide. This was the one that blew our minds. Um, on the left, ELL kids, kids who don't speak English as a first language. Of all the kids who were below satisfactory when they started the year, some kids didn't, the missile, 15% of the kids who didn't use Reading Plus did better, but 46% of the kids who used Reading Plus in that group, in that cohort, did better, got to satisfactory or above on their standardized testing by the end of the year. So we had this <coughs> magic pill somewhere in there was that kids who didn't speak English as a natural okay. language. And if you think about what, what happened here, if you're designing an interface for people who struggle with reading and you know you can't put a bunch of text, you think that would help people who don't speak English as a first language? Maybe? Um, this is the bad panda slide. <laughs> and I think I actually stole this from Ethan's bucket site, so <laughs> sorry. Uh, awkward. Um, there's always been some, there's been some problems. Um, the biggest one is when people hack each other's accounts. That's always my favorite. A uh, kid will hack a teacher's account and then send dirty messages to the entire class. That's happened. Um, yeah, it's awesome. <laughs> Um, there was a, uh, the kids, so uh, awesome that it's all in HTML5, and awesome that high school students know how to use the Chrome Inspector. <laughs> uh, yeah, it's great, because they, they'll come in on a Sunday night, and what they'll do is they'll, uh, they'll modify the screen to make it look like they've done all the work for the week, take a screenshot, and then they'll come in on Monday morning, and the teacher will say, you didn't do your assignments, and they'll be like, what are you talking about? I totally did it. Reading Plus is broken. So, so that happened. <laughs> yeah, that happens. And it's like, careful what you wish for. Maybe it should have been a flash app. Um, and uh, there's always cheating. And we're constantly trying to stay ahead of the cheating. Um, I, a long-winded way of saying what this really comes back to, though, is that culture piece, right? There's no really great tool that's going to help you adapt to the way your users are going to use your product. You can't tell them how to use your product. And certainly if it's like the broccoli of their day and they don't want to use your product, you know, um, they're going to find ways to abuse it. But we deal with that because that's who we are. That's our culture. Right? Getting back to that language, that culture, those students. Remember why they're using the program. Um, parting shots, this is uh, not warnings, but kind of warnings, and sort of warnings, but positive warnings. Um, <laughs> If your distributed team doing a story map on a wall is probably not the best option, right? That's hard. Doing, doing collaborative UX in a distributed team that brings energy into the room is really freaking hard. Um, I recommend the Post-it Notes app if you haven't seen it. Um, everyone loves specificity, except the people who live in ambiguity, right? My, that was my thesis right now is designers and engineers are the people who love ambiguity. And the people who train, test, sell, they don't like ambiguity. They like, this is what it's going to look like by here, and this is how it's going to function. And your designers and your engineers are like, well, I could do this. <laughs> I got to go look at the code that I wrote back in the old days. Um, changing tools and process is hard. You have no process, adding a process is hard. You may not need a process, but your tools, you're going to use tools. You're going to change them. It's inevitable. Look for ways to force that change. You know? I like change agent. Jordan said that. It is kind of a cliche, but not if you're doing it. You know, if you, you cause change to happen, um, then you're always ready for it. And the last one, it's kind of a web of, of, web of tools, uh, sorry, team values, culture, product, language. They're all intertwined in this ball of what you produce. Okay, I've got about two minutes left, so this is my end of meta piece. Um, <coughs> shared understanding as quickly as possible. You've got a whole bunch of people who all have different inputs and aspects that they see of the problem and how they can help fix it. Your culture and your tools are how you're going to do that. Okay. Um, then, favorite slides. Uh, 
So this is about how are you being experienced. Um, I, I guess what I'm challenging myself to do every day now is ask more than just how are the humans who use your product experiencing it. Ask how the human beings who you are designing your product with experiencing you. What is your impact on the human beings you interact with in your office, your customers, every day? Like, how do you show up for them? The reason I ask this is uh, every interaction, whether it's on the web, in a game, or in real life, is a chance for you to join somebody else's story. Okay? Right? We're all living this big story, and you intertwine with people. I had a really uh, interesting day a couple of weeks ago where I was in the middle of, a, of chaos. I'm sorry, I'm being really ambiguous here. I invited a couple people who I'd never met before during the course of that day to join my story by telling them exactly what had been going on in my life up to that point. And all of them jumped in and were totally willing to do so. So that's what I'm, I'm asking myself to do is figure out where you're joining somebody's story. Today I'm joining all of yours and you're joining mine. And so with that in mind, think about you build this great story map of experience in your application. But the truth is, your application is this tiny little bit part in their life. Most of it. That's all I got.